Lynn, she keeps sliding down and he keeps moving closer. You'll be glad to know even at home, Julie and I are practicing social distancing. Governor Hope, that's Julie, enacted a doghouse order. So I'm back in the doghouse again. I spend a lot of time there, but again, social distancing at its best. Now, I want you to look at this title. We're going to look for just a moment, go into God's Word, and consider a lesson entitled, How to Survive Anything. That is not my original title. This is from Reader's Digest, May 2019. But just this past week, I saw that title and I thought that might have great insight for what we're going through right now as a nation. This pandemic, how to handle this, how to handle anything, the title says. And of course, the subtitle was Expert Advice on Navigating Life's Perils, Great and Small. And so I was excited. I was excited to see the title and I thought, hey, expert advice, that's exactly what we need at this time. We need some true wisdom to handle these perils or this peril that we're presently involved in. Now the author is right here. She did a great job handling what she handled. But as I picked up the article and as I started to read, here are some of life's perils that she mentioned. And all of them sort of fit into this category, a shark attack. And, and it began by saying, our chances of a shark attack are one in 11 and a half million. I can even improve those odds. There are no sharks in my bathtub, and that's as close as I'm getting. But a shark attack, so I thought, well, maybe the next one, a blown out tire, uh, a pot that is boiling over. Now, if you think that's one of life's perils, their advice was to put a wooden spoon over the mouth of the pot. And that wooden spoon evidently is going to cool down the, you know, it's going to make the, the boiling over just condensation. It's going to fog up. And so keep that in mind. That's one of life's perils. A stub toe. One of life's perils. Another one, a bad haircut. Well, I thought, you know, I've always heard the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut was two weeks. And they didn't mention that. An overflowing toilet. Now, the expert advice they gave on this was stop flushing. That's brilliant, isn't it? Again, a bully in the jury room. You know, and I thought, hey, just watch 12 Angry Men. That's all you have to do. I've got the tape if you want to borrow it. And always losing your keys. And so needless to say, this article didn't provide us with, with much insight, with much wisdom, with much help on how to handle life's perils. And I thought when I read this, I thought, you know, about our Wednesday night class. You remember in Jeremiah 12 and verse 5, God says, If you've run with footmen and they've wearied you, how will you contend with horses? And that's what I thought. If they're classifying these things as life's perils, what are we going to do when we really face perils? And so this morning, quickly, I want us to look at seven spiritual survival skills. These will help us survive anything. This is not man's wisdom, this is God's wisdom. And remember, within the pages of Holy Writ, within the pages of God's book, the Bible, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. And so think about these things, because Jesus did say, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. John 16 and verse 33. And so the first thing, the first spiritual survival skill, do not panic, pray. Do not panic, pray. Panic, if you look it up, it's an overwhelming fear. And you know in Psalm 62 and verse 1, the psalmist said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock 
that is higher than I. Do not panic. Let's not fill our hearts with an overwhelming fear. Well, what do we do then? Well, we pray. There's a reason why the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. You remember 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17? There's a reason for that. God knows, as we've already mentioned, in this world you will have tribulation. We need to learn how to pray. and We need to pray fervently, do we not? The Bible teaches that the prayer of the upright is God's delight. Proverbs, 18, and Proverbs 15 and verse 8. And so we need to pray. That delights God and it calms us. In Luke 18 and verse 1, Jesus taught a parable that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. How do we not lose heart during times like this? When things keep going from bad to worse, well, we pray. That's what Jesus said, that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. If you're losing heart, please consider your prayer life. Please consider that habit. Are you keeping it up? Are you praying even more fervently at this time? So don't panic. Pray. Secondly, do not fear. Have faith. Again, this panic, this fear. Well, so many times the Bible tells us do not fear or fear not. And again, if we can't fret, if we can't worry, what do we do? We, we pray and we have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 and remember this now, faith, the Christian's faith, has evidence. The world likes to look at the Christian in his or her faith and say, well, you've got a blind faith. No, the Christian's faith is not blind. It's based upon substance. It has evidence behind it. Now, the atheist faith, it is a blind faith. What they believe in is a spider's web. Job 8 and verse 14. There's no substance behind it. That's why the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14 and verse 1. And so, do not fear, have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 6 and, I mean, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And remember this faith we're talking about. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Once again, we're drawn to God and his word at all times, but certainly at times like this. Again, do not think, trust. Now, let me qualify what I'm saying, do not think. Obviously, God wants us to think. Come, let us reason together, God says in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. God wants us to think. He gave us a mind, a heart, so that we can think. In Matthew 21 and verse 28, Jesus says, What think ye? And then he went on to talk about the father who had two sons and went to the first and said, Go work today in my vineyard. But Jesus wanted man to think. Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul said, Think on these things. Let your mind dwell on these. So I'm not talking about the right thinking. What I have in mind here goes back to 2 Kings 5 and verse 11. Naaman, the leper. And remember when he had a preconceived idea of what the prophet should do and the prophet didn't do it, he left, he was furious, and he said, Behold, I thought. Well, Naaman, that's your problem. You thought instead of listening to God and to his word. And so do not think in that fashion. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. That kind of worldly thinking is always going to get us in trouble. It offers no survival skill at all because it leads to death. But again, do not think, trust. 
Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. That's the kind of thinking we're talking about. When I lean to my own understanding, when I'm going to follow my own thought instead of listening to my God. You remember in 1 Samuel 3, verses 9 and 10, Speak, Lord, thy servant is listening. Samuel did not say, Lord, be quiet, I'm thinking. I'm thinking through this. I, I have the answers. He didn't say that. No, you speak, and I'll listen. And the implication is when I listen, then I'm going to obey. So do not think, trust. Again, do not be shaken by the wind, but strengthened by the word. You remember what Jesus asked? In Matthew 11 and verse 7, he asked the people, what did you go out to look at? He's talking about John, John the Immerser, John the Baptist. What did you go out to look at? A reed shaken by the wind. That's where a lot of people are because they don't have their faith in God because our prayer life is not what it ought to be. And so at times there is panic. At times there's fear. We see this in the world. But once again, don't be shaken by the wind. You remember Ephesians 4 and verse 14, tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Well, we're not to be like that. Don't be shaken by the wind, but be strengthened by the word of God. Let me read a verse. In Psalm 119, of course, you know that that psalm is devoted to praising God for his law, for his word, for his statutes, his precepts, his judgments. And in Psalm 119 and verse 28, listen to this carefully. My soul melts from heaviness. And then notice what he adds. Strengthen me according to your word. Not shaken by the wind, but strengthened by the word. What did Paul say in Acts 20 and verse 32? Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You go to Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, verse 10. And then what follows is the Christian armor, and it's all about God's word, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so if we're going to survive the attacks of Satan, if we're going to survive anything that this world throws at us, we cannot be shaken by the wind. We must be strengthened by the word. Notice this. Do not be filled with anxiety, but filled with answers. Now the first part of this, remember Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Notice that contrast. Be anxious for nothing, nothing, but in everything. So we're not anxious about anything. We're prayerful in everything. Don't be filled with anxiety, but filled with answers. What I mean by that, we have an opportunity as Christians to help those in our society who are caught up in the fear, in the panic. Now let me tell you something, this is serious. Our government is not enforcing rules because this isn't serious at all. But some, again, because there's no spiritual foundation, they're going to go to the fear, the panic. They don't have answers. We should, and we should be able to lovingly help people at this time. We're to sanctify the Lord as God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks us the reason, the hope that is within us with meekness and with fear. And so somebody might want to know, why are you not afraid of this? Why are you not terrified? Why don't you panic? Well, because of faith in God. Yes, it's serious. But let me tell you something. God's word, his promises are more powerful than any pandemic known to mankind. And his word 
doesn't create problems. It solves them. It blesses humanity. It strengthens us. Again, number six, do not drift away, but draw near. Hebrews 2 and verse 1 talks about some who were drifting away. James 4 and verse 8, again, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. This is a time since really we are sequestered, we are, you know, quarantined in a sense. This is a time for us to pray. This is a time for us to study. This is a time for us to draw near to God. And we have that precious promise. If we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. It goes back to like Philippians 4. We've already mentioned verse 6. Be anxious in nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and souls in Christ Jesus. If you look at that promise there, God says, I'm making you a promise right here in Philippians 4. If you'll stop being anxious about everything, you be anxious for nothing. And if you'll start praying about everything, he says in verse 7 that I am going to send a guard. It is a sentry. And this sentry is going to be guarding your hearts. What is that sentry that God sends? It's his peace. And that peace surpasses all understanding. The world can't understand it. The world doesn't recognize it. The world has never experienced this because they don't know the Prince of Peace. But we can and we should. So don't drift away. Draw near. And last of all, do not rend your garments, but rejoice in the Lord. The rending of garments throughout the Bible, this was an outward sign of inward grief and sorrow. And so when somebody had grief, when somebody had sorrow, they would tear their clothing, they would rend their garments. Well, we don't have to. We shouldn't. Don't rend your garments, but rejoice in the Lord. I asked Julie last night, what's your favorite verse on rejoicing? And we both, you know, said quickly, well, it's probably Philippians 4.4. 4. It's the most well-known, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16, rejoice evermore. You know, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 8, Peter's talking to second-generation Christians they didn't see the Lord in the flesh. They never got to witness him walking upon this earth. But Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Just like that peace that surpasses all understanding that Christians possess, we have a joy that's inexpressible. You can't put in words the complete joy that we have in Christ. Let me read a passage as we conclude this morning. It's one that we began with last Sunday morning. It's from Habakkuk, the third chapter, verses 17 and 18. I keep gravitating to this passage even more now than ever before. Habakkuk is using what is common to them, what they know as the norm. And his point is going to be, even if everything that is common is no longer common, even if everything that typically is normal is no longer normal, his point is we're still going to love the Lord. We're still going to joy in Him. We're still going to rejoice in Him. But look at verse 17, Habakkuk 3 and verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit or no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of our salvation. Even though our whole world be turned upside down, 
Habakkuk said, you, you can believe this. I'm going to joy in God. I'm going to rejoice in Him. Let me paraphrase verse 17. Let me bring it up to date for us. We could say something like, even though Wall Street's bell does not ring, though the Dow Jones ends down, Though there be no children in our schools and no children on her playgrounds, though our restaurants close and there be no toilet paper on the shelf, yet, notice verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. As you know, the Bible is so relevant we might look for wisdom from this world, and at times we can find it, but if you find wisdom in the world, I'll guarantee you this, their wisdom is going to reflect what the Bible has taught forever. Again, how to survive anything, how to survive this present pandemic. Well, let's turn our hearts and our minds, our being to God. And let's not worry, but let's continue to work in his vineyard. Again, if you're here this morning and have never obeyed the gospel, it certainly is time. You know, there's one disease, and God does set forth sin as a contagion, as a disease. There's one sin that, or disease that we're not going to recuperate from if we don't repent of it, if we don't leave it. And of course, that is sin. We've all sinned. We've all come short of His glory. Romans 3 and verse 23. But Jesus came. He bore in His body our sins upon that tree. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. When we hear the word, let's readily receive it. Let's unite it with faith. It tells us that we've sinned. Let's be humble enough to repent of sin. Let's be willing and ready to confess. Confess not only our sins, but confess faith in Him. The one who wants to be our Savior, the one who will be our shepherd through life. And let's respond in obedient faith to be baptized into Christ for the remission of those sins. The Bible teaches He'll add us to His church will be numbered with the redeemed, the saved. We can now glorify God in the flesh, just like His beloved Son did. A body thou hast prepared for me, Hebrews 10 and verse 5 says of Jesus. And Jesus offered that body as a sacrifice to His Father. Well, God has prepared bodies for each and every one of us. Let's likewise offer them as sacrifices to our God in doing His will. If you need to respond, won't you come while we stand together as we sing.
be led in a closing prayer by Brother Tom Edwards. When Brother Tom concludes his prayer, I'd like everybody to suffer me and remain just a moment to expedite the uh, exit. We don't want uh, to ruin all this wonderful social distancing by jamming us all up in the, in the foyer. Brother Tom. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful that we have had this time to be together, and we pray that you'll continue to watch over us as we leave this place. Continue to be with those that have not been able to be here due to illness or, or other issues. Just continue to be with us that we will be in contact with them this week and just help us to be the servants you'd want us to be even during this time. We pray that you'll continue to watch over us all as we go throughout this week. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, I want to thank Ken and Tyler and all the men that participated to make this service uh, um, go as well as we would like. Now, uh, what I would like, make sure on your way out you dispose of your refuse from the communion, and then there's a, a, a basket to put your uh, contribution in. We're going to dismiss from my left to my right uh, this section here, please. Uh, Llewellyn, where's Llewellyn? I need to see Paul. Oh, okay, so he needs, okay. Go ahead, section, and when this section is finished, this section, this section, this section. Thanks everybody for coming out and um, be careful, be safe.